In this lecture, we're going to continue talking about some more with dplyr, some more of these functions that are very helpful for you to add on to the ones that you've already learned in dplyr. So in the last lecture, we just talked about the separate function. The unite can do kind of the opposite. So um, a lot of times that this will show up is when you're working with dates, and sometimes the information, the different kind of date information, like year and month and day, will show up in different columns. So let's take a look, make sure that you have tidyverse loaded, and then we'll do this date example. So if we take a look at that, you can see that we've got a small data frame where we've got the information for different date components in different columns. We have year, then month, then day. All right, so we can use unite to join these elements of the date together so that then we can do operations like use Libre date functions on them to transform them into a date class if we want. So we can use unite for that. The first argument is date example. This is the name of the data frame we want to bring in. Then next we need to specify the name that we want for that new column. Again, we get to pick what this is. So in this case, let's do that it equals a date. Then for the next part, we need to specify which columns we want to use to join together. We can use the same rules for select here. So in this case, we want to join year, month, and day. So we can do that syntax of everything from year to day. And then the final piece, if we want, we can specify what we want to use to separate those elements with the set. So maybe we want to separate them all with hyphens. We could do that. So let's run that. And you can see down here, now it's transformed it. Now, if we wanted to, it's much easier at this point to run functions from Lubridate. We can pipe right in and do mutate. And let's see, so we have year, month, day. So we could do date equals year, month, day of date. And now you can see it's changed it into that date class. But we could do this because we took those different elements of the date and joined them together by using unite, and then we had them in a single column that we could operate with instead of spread across several columns where it was hard to work with. Now, as a reminder, right now, we've printed this out, but we haven't changed the original data. If you wanted to make sure that you could um, kind of save and use this data with these transformations, you would need to make sure that you reassign. So right now, because we have it reassigned, you can see the date example is still in its original form. But if you want to reassign, you can do like that. The other thing to try, and do make sure you rerun date example before you try this, is because unite takes as its first argument the data frame, we can actually pipe into it. All right, so I've taken that date example and taken it out from unite so that instead of it being the first argument in unite, it gets piped into that first argument position. So you can see that that has also worked down here. So this next piece is walking through those different steps. The next thing that I want to talk about is using the group by to, to create grouping before you do some of your other functions. So we've seen it with summarize, but we haven't seen it with some of these other functions like mutate and slice. So when you use it with these other ones, you're not going to be summarizing just down to a few rows. Instead, it will do something similar to the operation it was doing before, but it will do it within each of those separate groups. It turns out that this can be uh, pretty helpful. So we'll look at the World Cup data set again. And again, so we could do the fairway package for that. And then that's the World Cup data set. As a reminder, here's what it looks like. And we've got some different things like um, the team and position and time and so on. So let's take World Cup and I'll make sure to do those row names to column to bring in the player name. We'll do that as player maybe. All right. So now we've got that column in as well. Now, if we do something like um, mutate and do time equals mean of time. So this is saying that we want a new column. Actually, let's, let's make this, let's call this mean time. 
So we want a new column called time. And in this case, maybe let's also select. So we've just got a few of our columns. Let's do player, team, position, and time. All right, so we're creating a new column named mean time. And that'll just take the mean of the time. If we run it like this, you can see that it's using the exact same value for every single player. Now, if we do group by instead, we can get that mean value but within each of a certain group. So for example, say that we want this mean time for that player's position. We could do group by and do position and now Python. When we do this group by, it's going to kind of tack on that grouping information. So when this mutate runs, it will run within each group instead of as a whole. So you can see that now. And in this case, we still have the same number of rows. We haven't lost anything or summarized anything. We still have one row per player. But now the mean time is different across different players. Within players who have the same position, so these first two are both midfielders, it's the same. This is the mean time among midfielders. But then you can see it's different between a midfielder and a defender, and between a midfielder and a forward. Another thing that we can do with this is we can run it before we do slice. So if you'll remember, slice just takes um, a certain number of rows, and it does them by position. So if I run slice, it just pulls the first two rows of the whole data frame. But if I do group by first and pick one of the factors to group by, this time let's do team. Now what it will do is it will slice the first two rows of each team. So you can see we have the first two players mentioned for Algeria and then the first two for Argentina and so on. One way that this can be helpful is if you use it in conjunction with a range. So we can do a range and let's do maybe like descending time. And now if we slice in, what we'll get is the top two players in terms of the amount of time they were playing. Now you can play around with this with the top end function as well. Um, but again, by doing the group by first, it will get it by team. So you have those separate values for each team rather than doing it for the whole data set. So these next three sli few slides go through and talk about that, doing the slice in this case by position, and then getting the saves, and again, doing that arrange, and then slicing out the top value for each. The last thing that I wanted to talk about here are two functions, two more functions in that join family. But in this case, these don't actually join two data frames together. Instead, they will take one data frame and either give you everything that doesn't have a match in another one or everything that does have a match in the other one. Uh, it turns out, I know this seems like this could be a weird thing to, to have in there, but it turns out it can be pretty helpful sometimes. So let's go and um, take a look at, at doing this, and then we'll come back and look at the, these general kind of principles of how it's working. So I have a separate set of example data frames to use here. Um, one's called course grades and one's called course times, and we can take a look at those two. So course grades is giving three different courses by name and then a grade for each of those. Whereas course times is giving three different courses and then a day for each of these. And there are some that overlap, like math and science show up in both of them, but there are some that don't. So English only shows up in the first and art only shows up in the, in the second. So in an earlier lecture, we looked at doing join. So let me do an example of full join here. And with that, we did the left data frame, and then we did the right data frame, and then we set what we wanted to join by. So this actually matches up by course, since we set by course, and pulls in the columns from both of the data frames. So we've got a data frame that's brought in information from both, and where it could, it matched up by the course. If we do this semi-join, what will happen is we won't get as much of this information. We will only get um, we'll only get what we had for columns for the original one, and it will only include ones that have a match in, in the second data frame, even though it doesn't pull it in. So let me show that. If we do a semi-join, so again, course grades only has the columns course and grade. And when we do one of these joins, we get day added on because that's coming from the right data frame.
When we do semi-join, we don't get day added on, but instead what's happened is it's taken this full data frame and it's only kept the rows where there was a match with the course with this other data frame we sent in. Anti-join does the opposite. It will only keep the things that don't have a match. So in this case, that's only English. So we have these little kind of cartoons to look at that. Semi-join again will only keep the rows from the first data frame where it has a match, where it's in that kind of inner portion. So because math and English in this, in this example, and I apologize, these are slightly different from the ones I was just showing in the code. But in this case, math and English show up in both of those. And so when you do a semi-join, it will take the information in the original data frame, but filter down just to the rows where there's a match with course to the right-hand data frame. And then anti-join does the opposite. It will only keep the things that do not show up in that right-hand data frame.